Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Big Game Hunters. I'm Mike. And I'm Tom. Today, we're going to review Guillotine, a short filler game from Wizards of the Coast. But first, we have Chit Chat. In today's Chit Chat, we're going to be talking about hosting a game night and introducing new players into gaming. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Chit Chat. In today's Chit Chat, we're going to be talking about hosting a game night and getting new people into gaming. These are both really important topics because if you don't have a good player group, you're never going to get those games off the shelf. So I know that hosting game nights at home has been, there are some challenges involved with it. Sure. Uh, for me personally, I found that if I try to host a game night on any, at anything but a regular date and time, day and time, once a week, it just doesn't happen. You know, if we say, oh, you know, we'll play someday this week or something, you know, people start canceling. and it, it, As soon as we get away from the schedule, it just doesn't happen. It falls apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, my uh, own game night experience at home is mostly based around role-playing games. Usually when we get together, we get together to play like a one-shot or uh, continuing an old campaign. But we do like to throw in filler games, and occasionally we'll do a long board game instead of a role-playing game. But we don't do it consistently. It's, I, that's probably our main problem, but even if I were to say every Friday... We're a game and nobody would show up mm -hmm. just because <laughs> that's, the way, sad, that's the way we roll, I guess. <laughs> or don't roll, as the case may be. Right. Uh, how long do you guys usually like to do game night? It's four to six hours usually. Yeah. Um, not recently, but back in the day, we used to have long game nights. It's like, I think everybody has this phase in college where you'll sure. play whatever it is for a whole weekend or yeah. a series of games for a whole weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that can turn into a pretty intense game night. Mm-hmm. And when you're getting people together for game night, another thing that I have a problem with is, you know, sometimes even if we have a long night, we'll end up wasting a lot of time trying to pick a game. Yeah. I have most of the game. I have the biggest collection. I'm the one who has most of the games. People come over to my house. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm pushing games on people. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to feel like, hey, this is what I'm kind of interested in tonight. Let's, we're all going to play this. I feel like since I own the games and I like all the games in my collection for obvious reasons, I want other people to kind of make that choice but for the most part they you know feel like they kind of they're in the same boat they don't want to force a game on somebody so we end up kind of dancing around and not really playing something right away i suppose that is one drawback of playing so consistently is that you sort of get that analysis paralysis of which yeah you're gonna play. exactly we don't really have that problem just because our gaming nights are so few and far between you know, you're talking when you see them over dinner or whatever, and you say, mm. hey, we should get together and play this, and everyone sure. gets excited about that, so we all show up and start playing right away. The filler games come in when you're waiting for someone or, or taking a break or whatever. Do you usually try to announce what games you're going to be playing before the game night? That's something I've tried in the past for bigger games. Well, I do the announcement um, not for my home game nights, but for, uh, say, I'm trying to organize a uh, board game day at mm. a game store or something like that. Uh, and where I live, there are a lot of game stores, but they mostly focus on Magic the Gathering and comic books. They they carry board games, but you don't really go there to That's play not board. The focus. Right. Sure. So when I, when I encounter a new store like that, <clears throat> and it's close enough to home, I don't like to commute. Uh, I will start to try to get a board game day or night going at that store. So I'll basically volunteer to like demo board games off their shelf mm -hmm. for them. Uh, and when you're doing that, you definitely want to get the word out about the game that's going on that day. Because otherwise, uh, you you will run into people who just like or show up and are curious, and if they're not real interested in the game they see, or maybe it just wasn't what they had pictured, they're, they're going to hightail it out of there. But if you really advertise in advance, you know, I'm going to be demo demoing Battlestar Galactica yeah. this Saturday from noon to four, then you get people to show up because you get Battlestar Galactica fans and, I don't know, a board game fans in general. Sure. So you feel like that helps focus it? Yeah, absolutely. The, announcing it beforehand, especially to a blind audience, to people mm -hmm. who are, aren't engaged like with the store or with the hobby or whatever, it's really important yeah. to getting people in, there, in the door. Um, talking about kind of games planned in advance or an ability to choose games and uh, doing games in a more organized setting, when I was in college, I was uh, part of a gaming group and we had a pretty big game club there. We had, on average, I would say 20 to 30 people show mm -hmm. up you know, every weekend, mm -hmm. every Saturday night. And we would play for a long time. I mean, that would go from you know seven in the evening until sometimes seven in the next and morning. A bunch of different games, right? And that and well, that's what I was going to get to. It's, I think because it was big, but everyone came every week and knew everyone knew each other. 
uh, everyone, since everyone was so familiar with one another, it was a little easier to get into a game uh, because somebody wasn't saying, we're doing this. You know, this is what the whole group is. You know, if I have four people over my house, we're only doing one game at a time. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's very easy in that setting when you have a whole you know, library of games out there for somebody to grab something and say, hey, I'd like to play this. Are three other people with me? Right. I think that's kind of a, an easier way to do it in a lot of ways because it, it, it absolutely you're is. not taking up the whole evening and you're not taking up the yep. whole group's attention. If if you have that sort of group dynamic where everyone is comfortable with, with each other and they're interacting, the decisions can get made really quickly and that's awesome. The drawback is that if it's a like public group where you're inviting outsiders to come yeah. in, the, the organizer at the least and usually all the participants really have to be proactive yeah. to include those outsiders. Otherwise, you end up you and your friend just end up sitting there playing alone. Yeah, I've had that experience for sure. Uh, I went to a local gaming club uh, where I live, and it only met once a month, so we didn't get, you know, the camaraderie didn't come right, right. away. It, it would take time to develop and, that too. Yeah, and they had little signs you would put up, you know, if you're looking for players, but it was kind of like speed dating or something. It was just a little bit uncomfortable. Sure, yeah. So I agree with you that the organizer has to take an active role in terms of integrating people. That's why I think announcing the game, at, in a setting like that where you've got a blind audience, I like to call them, announcing the game beforehand is really like a path to entry to that group mm. because then you have that, you instantly have that thing in common. I'm interested in this game. That's why I'm here. So. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Uh, now, in terms of getting people into gaming who aren't gamers, because these, you know, so far we've talk, been talking about a game night where everyone's already on the same page. Yeah. Everyone is already a gamer to some extent or another, and they're there for that reason. What about when somebody isn't a gamer? Well, the most experience I have in this is like a party type setting where you're playing a party game or uh, are you a werewolf, something like that. Mm. Uh, and someone in the group who isn't really a gamer, they, they probably have played games like this before but never moved beyond them. And then enough people in the group are like, that was fun, now let's go yeah. play World of Warcraft or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so in lieu of excluding that person, you have to try and incorporate them. So you're trying to pick a game where it's easy enough for that person to learn. Um, the, there probably is some strategy because that's the reason you want to move on to a different game. Mm -hmm. But the strategy can't be too complex because this person, you know, they haven't really developed that skill set yet. So they just need to be able to maybe rely on the game to give them some luck to, to move ahead, sure. things like that. They need to be able to make some progress early. Sure. So mm -hmm. so that's a large por portion of the reason I like those kind of games. So like Last Night on Earth right now is coming to mind. I, I think that's a really, not a great gateway game, but it's it's a good stepping stone. Like if, if everyone in the group is ready to play something with a little leg, but you got that one person who yeah. doesn't really know what they're doing, everyone can just sort of help them and, you know, you don't, sure. have to, you don't have to get into the too nitty gritty of the rules because they aren't all that complex. Yeah, I mean, I can see with Lesson on Earth potential alpha gaming when you have a cooperative setting like right. that. But other than that, I think that is a kind of a good gateway because it looks so, it's so clear from across the hall what's happening in that game. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, a good gateway game, it has to be immediately obvious to some extent what's going on. Sure. You know, if I'm, if I'm you know, across a crowded convention hall and I see Tigris and Euphrates for the first time, I'm going to have no idea what's happening. You know, I can't make heads yeah. or tails of it if I just have yeah. seen it. But if I see somebody playing Ticket to Ride, again, we talked about as an excellent gateway game, mm -hmm. it's very clear what's happening. People are laying trains across the across the U.S. You know, they're making these paths. They're, they're, it's, you know, they're connecting routes. It's very clear. So I think we're looking at uh, good, engaging theme, simple rules, mm -hmm. uh, maybe high luck factor mm -hmm. in a nice gateway game. Yeah, and simple rules are important, too. That's why last night's not, a, for me, a great one. Uh, because I feel like the rules are a little too finicky. Sometimes yeah. I feel like I, you know, new PA players feel a little overwhelmed. It is, it is really finicky, and uh, it, it is hard to go from I'm just explaining you the rule, the rules to you, to I'm alpha gaming because you don't quite understand them. Mm -hmm. That is a fine line. The reason I go to that game as a gateway game is it, it's really for me. It's party games and then stuff like Last Night on Earth. Sure. I, I don't have the ones that are in between. Oh, okay. I probably do need to work on building my library a little bit. Hmm. Maybe we'll talk about that in a future chit chat. Uh, Maybe. And I, I think also just, you know, having people exposed to board gaming. So in my college gaming club, we had, you know, it was an open invitation every Saturday. People knew about it. We publicized it. And anybody who was just walking through the hallway when those were going on could immediately hear how much fun we were having. Yeah. And so just having people who are energetic about it, 
people who are you know really get into it. Uh, I'll never forget. I had some you know people over visiting college, and there was a group of players playing Ticket to Ride. Normally, Ticket to Ride is kind of a somber game. You know, you're you're grabbing train cards, you're laying rails. It's interactive, it's fun, but it's not too rowdy. But these guys were just going nuts with it. You know, they were yelling about the man trains. <laughs> they were flipping out every time somebody took a route. It could be the smallest connecting piece. Every play was an, an event <laughs> for this group. And that, I looked at that game in a new light after that, and people really were like, what is going on with this? I, you know, I want to know what's, what's with this game. Well, I think it's... Uh... The most important thing that you get out of a game night is that everyone becomes more engaged in the hobby. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's probably where both of us have really developed our love for gaming is no interacting question. with other people around board games. That's really the reason we're here right now. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah, I think you said, it's start well your, said. Start your game night to get into gaming. And uh, today we're going to take a look at a very good gateway game, and we're going to review Guillotine. But first, I'm going to teach you how to play. Now I'm going to teach you how to play Guillotine. Guillotine is a fast-paced card game where players are rival executioners in revolutionary France. The object of the game is to collect the most points by killing the most valuable nobles. The game is played over three days, where each day begins with a line of 12 nobles lined up for the guillotine. To set up the game, first place the guillotine, and then set up 12 nobles in line. Then, deal five action cards to each player. Once you've done so, randomly determine who goes first, and that player will begin with his or her turn. The game is played out in a series of rotating turns. On your turn, you do three things. First, you may play an action card. You do not have to play an action card. Most action cards will alter the line in some way, such as trip. This is important because after you play your action card, or pass, then you collect the first noble in line closest to the guillotine. When you do so, you place that noble in your score pile, and at the end of the game, that noble is worth points equal to the number in the bottom corner. After collecting your noble, you'll draw one action card. You draw this card and add it to your hand, even if you did not play an action card this turn. There is no hand limit. Play continues in this manner until the line runs out. Once every noble in the line has been killed, you simply move or discard it. You'll move on to the next day. When you begin a new day, You'll deal out 12 new nobles from the noble deck in line, and then the player to the left of the player who started the first day will begin the second day. You'll do this again for the third day with the player to the left of that player starting. At the end of the third day, every player simply counts up all the points on the nobles in his score pile, and the player with the most points wins. That's how you play Guillotine. Now that you know how to play this simple game, we're gonna take a look at it in our point-counterpoint review. Because Mike and I agree about this game, I'm gonna roll to see which of us will argue for the game and which of us will argue against. If it's even, I'll take the pros, and if it's odd, he will. Odd again. It's odd again. <laughs> so I will be telling the audience again how much I enjoy this game and apparently the entire hobby of gaming, <laughs> while Tom will... I, I cannot stand games. <laughs> Scroogingly tell you how he just, I don't even know why we brought him along. It's the worst. Rain on a parade. But he can't rain on this parade because it's a parade of delicious death. It's a quick, simple filler that nobody can resist. Uh, I bring this out with any kind of group, uh, any mixed group. The, the, you know, it just instantly, uh, it's very simple to learn, very easy to grasp. Um, the It has action cards, so it's not quite as simple as like, hey, that's my fish. Mm -hmm. But it's, so you do have to kind of be able to read and understand what the action cards are doing. Sure. Reading is important. But other than that, fundamental. But other than that, it's, you know, very straightforward. I can play with anybody. We did mention almost this exact same thing for That's My Fish, if I remember correctly. But I think the big difference here is that this one has so much luck involved. I don't think it's quite as universal of a filler game mm. as that. Particularly if you get someone who just doesn't like that there's no way to mitigate the, all the luck in the game. Like, the way the, the nobles come out can be sort of mitigated by the action cards, but if you never get those action cards, you're screwed. Mm -hmm. So the high amount of luck in this game, kind of a drawback for me. Yeah, uh, I can get behind that. This isn't going to be great for like, anybody who wants some strategy, some meat on their game. 
But that's okay. You know what? Even though I ha I really have no right to like this game because there really isn't that much depth to the play. But the theme just keeps me in. Uh, I love all the different co the all the different colors of nobles. Uh, you know, the, the, you have the church nobles. You have the royalty, the military. I just think that, and especially the innocent victims or the hero of the people. I just really think that it works well. Um, it, you know, the box says age 12 and up because the theme is a little bit mature for a game with the simplicity. Um, but it's just, it's a really funny game. I always laugh when I'm playing it. And I think what I like about it is that the humor is pervasive throughout the game. It's a comedic game that doesn't seem to dry up for me. It's not like what I like to not so affectionately call the flip and laugh games mm -hmm. or the take back games. This one, the theme really just works throughout the game. And I always have to draw attention to the piss boy when he comes up. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> piss boy. I mean, I, QED, I say. Right. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> yes, the theme is great. But some of the cards are a little overpowered, wouldn't you say? Uh, so it's a game that's played out over the course of three days. But, hey, um, I can end a day early, and I win the game. Ooh, look at me. No, you don't need Scarlet Pimpernel. Same thing with the Callous Guards. This game is, a, is fun because everybody's like manipulating the line, trying to score points. And when you have those cards that stop that, there's two in the game. One is Palace Guards. What's the other one? Uh, Robespierre, is that right? Robespierre ends the day. Ends the Scarlet day. Pimpernel. Um, Callous Guards... Yeah, you can't alter the line with callous guards. Isn't there somebody when he's at the front of the line can't alter it? The unpopular judge. There you go. So the unpopular judge is forgivable because he's a noble. He's going to get to the front and you're going to get rid of him. But the callous guards, is, it just stays in play. Right. You can go around the turn several times and that just ruins the fun of the game. So there are yeah. at least two cards that just ruin the game. Um, I don't know if Piss Boy is enough to make up for him. <laughs> But it's going to take me pretty far. I agree Callous Guards is a negative play experience. We talked about that in a previous episode. It just totally shuts down the gameplay. But, uh, you know, like I said, it gets by pretty far in theme, and the components really help to elevate it. Uh, you know, it's got really nice card stock. I've played it a lot. I've played Piss Boy a lot. Uh, it, it's, it really holds up well. It's nice plastic-coated playing cards. Uh, the Guillotine is a huge addition. Uh, what would be an otherwise kind of unremarkable game component-wise, mm -hmm. production quality-wise, is really lifted up by the guillotine. And it just, like we mentioned in the gateway game discussion earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, previously in this episode, that if you can look at a game across a crowded convention hall and immediately know what's going on, it's, it grabs people. It's a good yeah. way to get non-gamers yeah. into it. The guillotine makes it that. The guillotine makes it so that people can immediately grasp the idea of... Right. A raucous line of 12 nobles right. just, you know, marching down the order to get their heads chopped off. It's true. The production value is great. It's too bad. It's all tucked into a crappy little tuck box. Mm. Uh, this game isn't that old, and you can already see it's starting to warp a little bit. Also, the storage for the two decks of cards isn't great because once they're in there, they're going to get shifted around and mixed together. You just have to separate them when you take them back out anyway. The box is a con. I don't even use the box anymore. Yeah. But that's, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it really it hurts some of the portability of the game, and it, it tuck boxes just suck, let's face it. it, uh, it they're not great for long-term storage. No, they're just not. But uh, that said, Tom, what do you think of it on the whole? E18 is fun. Uh, I've never really thought of it as a gateway game, but it's, it's a good point. It is. Uh, I, I, I love it. It's a great filler game. It's always a real quick game, and... It's just so easy to play with a group of pretty much anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Uh, wow, that's a really high score for it. Yeah. Uh, I also enjoy it. It's definitely a good gateway game. I actually was introduced to the game by a non-gamer friend of mine. Uh, she's into gaming now more, but this was a game that she had played long before she was exposed to more hobby games. So this is definitely one that anybody can pick up. Uh, like I said, the theme really does do it for me. It's a game, like I said, I have no right to like it. Any other game like this would fall flat for me because there's not much to it. I think because there's not much to it, uh, I'm going to have to give it a 7 out of 10. I enjoy it, but I'm not going to bring it out with you know a, a group of my regular gaming group. So it does hit the table, not as much as I would it, it really could for other games. Sure. All right, sure. well, that's our review of Guillotine. Get ready for the breakdown.
And now we have the breakdown of Guillotine from Wizards of the Coast and designer Paul Peterson. It's a very short game. It plays out in about 30 to 40 minutes, so we give it 85 short and 15 long. We give it 15 slow because a player with a handful of cards can slow down the game pretty well. Otherwise, it's an extremely fast 85. The game is driven by mostly luck. All the cards you're going to see are random, but there's a little skill involved with manipulating those cards, so we give it 90 luck and 10 skill. You might stumble on a strategy that allows you to stack points, but otherwise you're grabbing as many points as you can each turn, so we give it 5 strategy and 95 tactics. You're really only concerned with the line on your own turn, and there are several ways to mess with your opponent's options, so we give it 50-50 for interaction independence. Guillotine is a comedic parody of the French Revolution, and the game engages that theme really well, overtly with the guillotine itself and subtly with the class structures in the cards. Still, it's just a point-gathering system, so we give it 70 emerging and 30 abstraction. It's an extremely simple game. About the only rulesy elements you're going to come across are the different ways you can manipulate the line. Some cards move it a fixed number and some are a variable number. So we give it 95 simplicity and 5 complexity. The actual guillotine is a fun and engaging component of the game and it looks great on the table. Otherwise, it's extremely portable. You can play it anywhere. So we give it 5 grandeur and 95 portability. We give it 15 expandability because you could always add more cards of both types, but you certainly don't need to, so we give it 95 completeness. Guillotine gets four trophies for originality because it's a cut above other filler games for its simple line mechanic and sharp theme. Five trophies in value because it's very inexpensive and the cards and the guillotine are of poker quality. They hold up well. Mike gives it seven out of 10. Tom is just ahead with eight out of 10. And that is the breakdown of guillotine. We hope you didn't mind waiting in line with us today for Guillotine. Next week in the Chit Chat, we're going to be talking about building a game collection, the idea of putting together a diverse library of games for any occasion. And we're going to be taking a look at Thunderstone, another great game by Mike Elliott. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for weekly updates. See the links below for our Facebook and Twitter pages. And leave us a comment on your last game night or your favorite gateway game. See you next week. Now that you know how to play uh, get battles. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna go back to episode one. <laughs>